All right. Why don't we give it up for the Lord and also for the worship team and the media team who's serving in the back, just to give it up for the for the worship team. And uh, today uh, we have a, a special special moment here. Um, today the Word of God will be preached by our very own leader and media director, uh, Mergel. So when he comes up, uh, just please give him a warm welcome, a warm round of applause uh, as he makes it up to the altar. Thank you. Are you guys okay? How was the worship? We're back to our old um, stand and I like it better. <laughs> the, 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 wood, the woody one was um, just a little too vintage for me. So I, f I like this one better. I like me meat hall. I don't, know. I don't know about you guys. It feels more modern to me. So, right. So it's my honor to be here. It's my privilege always to, to stand here. You know, I, I, I enjoy being at the back. I don't know, maybe because I'm an introvert, I like being in the shadow. Nobody sees me. And, and I, I realized in our previous ministry, I spent two years being in the media team. And after some time, when you, when you stop there, it just happens that you, you focus so much on that. The moment you come to church one hour earlier than everybody else, you set up everything, and then the service starts. You are busy, 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 and at the end of the service, you have to wrap up, clean up, and ch check up everything. And after two years, I realized that I don't know half of our church members because I'm so stuck up there. And I enjoy it personally. <laughs> As an introvert, I prefer being in the shadow. But anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a new adventure and it's always a good, a good thing for me to come up here. And today, uh, I want to talk about conquer the fear factor. Amen? And since the worship team already proclaim and, and, and declare it in the worship, I think we can all go home now. The, the deliverance is done. The job is done. Let's just go home. You're free from fear. Amen? Amen. <laughs> all right. But uh, since I prepared a message, I better be de delivering it right now. So are you guys ready? Let's pray. Would you extend your hands towards me for your own sake? Lord, thank you. It's a privilege to dive into your word and allow the living word of God to make us alive. So we invite you right now, Holy Spirit, breathe your life through your word into our lives, starting with me. And anoint my lips, God, to speak with authority and let me declare only what you are saying to your people. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. Right. So uh, I struggle with, uh, with this message a little bit because when you're talking about fear, fear is one of those topics uh, at, w that we talk about a lot, like at length in church. We, we, we talk about grace. We talk about love. We talk about fear. And fear is on the list of those topics where you can... You can actually take it from any an possible angle you imagine because there are so many sermons about fear. Who am I to come here today and, and think I can give you a very insightful or new message about fear? So I had that personal uh, struggle as I was approaching this topic, but it's been a little bit uh, of time since I just felt strongly that for in this season for TCCI, the Lord is saying something about fear and I just received my final confirmation last week as Pastor Day was standing here speaking about giving thanks during Chusok and he described the whole uh, idea and the whole practices behind Chusok and then he, he mentioned something very, very striking to me which was people actually go to Chusok and do all those things fundamentally because they are crippled by fear, fear for their future, fear for their lives, fear for their family. So they do all those ancestral uh, worship, idol worship, mainly because they want to protect themselves from the unknown, from the risk of life. So it's the, the core uh, motivation of people going to the village and doing all those practices 
injustices we talked about last week is because of fear. So as soon as I heard that, I was like, yes, yes, I need to speak about fear. I have to bring this message out. So today, that's what I'm, I'll be doing. And uh, we, when we talk about fear, I don't know that there is anybody here in this room who have never felt fear. I think even as you walk in the, in the, in the aisle coming here, you're, there is that, uh, is, this, is, is this the door? Are they here? Am, am, I, am, I, am I walking here? Am I alone? Like, is there, is there anybody in the room? Like, how is the worship going to be? Am I too loud? Am I singing too loud? Are people looking at me? You know, that, those insecurities popping up as you're worshiping, that fact fear factor is just part of our lives right we acknowledge it as we leave and just to bring you to make it to boil it down and and make it you know an, uh, more easy for you to understand I want to share a very personal story of uh, one of the craziest and most fearful moment of my life I'm gonna be very vulnerable and I hope you guys extend grace towards me you know, don't just stop at singing grace here. Now I, I need you to be practical and extend that grace to me, okay? So I think back in my sophomore year in, uh, in undergrad, me and my friend, we usually, uh, we, once a year or twice a year, we'll go hiking. And this is back in Cameroon. So when I say hiking, don't think of hiking in Korea, where you have a hiking course, the, 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 the road is clean, you have, you have a stop on the, in the middle of it, you can drink water. This is Cameroon, okay guys? Uh, in the middle of Africa. So when we say hiking, we prepare ourselves with machete and, or machete, and depending on the weather, we have to make our way as we go. So it takes us about two hours to get on the top and, two hour, and one hour and a half to get down. But the thing is, we don't know what environment or what will be the state of the road. And sometimes it's clean, sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's not. So it takes longer, it takes more time. So that time around, I think it was after the rain, it was at the end of the rainy season, because we don't have win uh, four seasons, but we have rainy and dry season. So it was at the end of the rainy season. So it was a little, you know, the, the weather was a little humid, but it was a good day. The weather was fine, and so we, make, uh, we made our way to the mountain when we get at the, at, the, at the bottom, and then we look up, we're like, guys, this is, there are a lot of trees with a lot of grass, so we have to clean up our way, so boys go first, girls come next, and then you have another group of boys at the end, I think it was a team of 11, and so we got there, and then we stopped making our way. But the thing you, you have to understand is that this is Cameroon, and people are, uh, growing crops in those areas. So there are fields of our agricultural fields uh, on our way. So we make our way, at some point we, we, we encounter such a field. I think the man owning, the owner of that, the farmer owning that land was taking advantage of now, after the rain, he's gonna seed his, uh, the, put the seeds in the ground and, and prepare for the harvest. So he had those, uh, how do you call the, the silos? The, he had prepared the ground, and then it was very ready, and, and you could see the forms there. So we clean our way, and we get right there, and we see the, the, the farm is there. It's empty, but it's there. And so we, we think, should we walk around? Because this is long. So should we go around the field or just go across very quickly, try to do a, as less damage as possible? Or, so we, we, we talk about it a little bit and we decided, you know what, let's jump the, the field and go fast. And so here we are jumping the, the, the lines and trying to make our way across the field. Little do we know that the man was walking, was still on the f in the farm as we were going across. So we are going up like this, and right where we are, when we are in, in the middle of the field, we see a man coming out of the of the of the what do you, whatever you call it, the small forest on top. So it's like there is a forest. We we come out of a forest. There is a farm. We go across the farm and we go back into the forest, and we have to go make our way up. So he is coming out of there, looking down on us, and we are looking up on him. Now imagine the scene. And my, our first instinct is to look at a guy, and he holds, bear, mind you, a long machete. Like it looks like a sword, because he's, he's working his, in his farm. So he comes down, 
think fast. What, what is he thinking? The guy has been working his butt all, the, all that morning, preparing his field. And here comes these teenagers, uh, and they are, they are just going across and pretending everything is fine. The guy went crazy. He started screaming, who are you? I'm about to kill you. And then he started jumping. So we look at a guy jumping on us and we turn. The time to turn, he's already at the, uh, right behind us. So now we are not even thinking about taking care of the farm anymore. We are just like, run, run, run. Everybody is screaming. It's insane. So we run back into the forest at this point, and we're trying to make our way. And I think I was in the middle of the crowd, and for some reason, I, I, I bumped my, 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 my leg on one of the roots there as I'm trying to make my way through the trees. So I, I crumble there, and I fall on the ground. Everybody is gone. I am the, one, the only one left behind. And I have this crazy man behind me saying, I am about to kill you. Who are you? Come out here. And I'm like, I start screaming too. Man. <laughs> now, I have, to be, I have to be very honest here. I saw my life my whole life. It was a very short life at that point. I was maybe 21 years old. I see my short life like flying in front of my eyes and I'm like, this is the end. And I don't know why, but for some reason, it, right there, I'm thinking of my mom. So I start saying, mom, I'm sorry. Mom, I'm sorry. Man, this is so ridiculous, so embarrassing. But Mom, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Mom. So sorry. And then, man, my friends, they heard it. They started laughing. And until my graduation, they would bring up that story again and again. <laughs> they would laugh at me for that episode. So anyway, just to give you, the story is just to give you, you know, a picture of what fear is. You know, your heartbeat spikes you you feel the danger you it's very emotional whether real or not sometimes we we feel that fear for th for for things that are not even for dangers that are not even real sometimes like in my story it's real it's like a real threat but the thing is at that moment you become completely irrational and you can't even explain what you're saying or what you're doing you just man you you feel lost and i think that's the closest the, uh, the uh, definition we can we can come up with when we're talking about fear it's a strong emotion coming out of a feeling of threat real or not and in that moment, we become completely irrational. So and now, this is a big moment that I just gave you. But we have small fears. Fr I have friends that fear dogs. I don't like dogs. I try not to fear dogs, but I have friends who, who dread dogs. I have a friend, she, she doesn't eat fish. When she sees fish, she imagines the bones come, uh, 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 like, uh, what's that, stopping in her throat. So she, she, she just blinks when she sees fish. She doesn't eat. It's not even allergy. You have people who fear cats, who fear insects. Like there is a, there is a bug in the room and you can't sleep, right? It's like it's that fear is there. And there are also generation, uh, generational fears. One of the things I think Pastor Day mentioned when we were talking about the, gener uh, the Gen Zs, is, and we're going to talk about it a little later, it's like Gen Zs are very fearless. But when you dig deep, you find that there is some fear there. We, I, am, I am 36 years old. I, I belong to, to the group called the Millennials. What do you think the Millennials fear the, fear the most? Yeah. Not having money yeah not having money not being it's like we grew up being we we want to we want to feel safe we want to feel that we have enough around us this is uh, one thing you'll find out with millennials before us the boomers generation our parents one of they were also you know, crippled with that fear of, of lack, fear of people. When you talk to, uh, to different generations, you have those uh, uh, <coughs> generational fears or that 
let's say, age-attached age uh, 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 type of fears. So we, now that we understand what fear is and we see it, it's real, it's in your life, it's in my life, and we can't really pretend it's not there. What does the Bible say about fear? What is, the, what is the Bible stand on fear? And that too is a big thing, right? Have you heard of the say, that, of the say going around along the lines of there about 365 times fear not in the Bible? I grew up in church, so I heard that a lot. People, a lot of pastors saying, hey, the Bible says 365 times, fear not. So the Bible, God wanted to have one, one, once a day that message for you, you have to remember that. All that to say, the fear thing is very big in the Bible. Almost as much as the Bible talks, talks about money, it talks about fear. You find fear not. You find the fear of God. You find a lot of verses about fear. I'm just going to give you a few examples. Isaiah 41, Isaiah 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkness of, 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 of through the darkness, the darkest valley, I will. Are you Christian? Uh, do we have Christians in this room? <laughs> Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will, not f I will fear no evil. We know this. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I? Exactly. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be? Yes. So the Bible goes on and on and on and on speaking about fear. You can't get open your Bible like even randomly without on, your, in, on both pages without finding a verse about fear. So the Bible has a lot to say, and again, God has a lot to say about fear, and which leads us to our main verse of today. And so we're going to read 2 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. <coughs> it says, <coughs> sorry, for for any reason. <clears throat> okay. Let's read it out loud together. One, two, three. For God gave us a spirit of, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Let's read it again. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. In the in New King James, it says, "For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind." So we see the Bible, as much as it says and speaks a lot about fear. Thank you, wife. Thank you. Oh, cool. Feels better, way better now. <clears throat> yeah. Get married, guys. <clears throat> That's the lesson here. So, as much as the Bible speaks at length about fear, we can see a very clear distinction here about fear as a feeling and the spirit of fear. And that is also confirmed in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Can we put it on the screen? Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So... <clears throat> Essentially, the Bible is saying, fear, 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 fear not. Fear not, for God is with you. But what is fundamental is the distinction here is you have received a spirit that is not a spirit of fear. Amen? So what does that mean? What is the difference between the, sp the spirit of fear and just fear? As we just saw, the dictionary will tell you, uh, give you a description of the feeling of fear that comes, that you have an encounter as you feel sad, as you feel happy, as you feel, I don't know, excited. You feel fear. 
It's an emotion. We are built with it. God created us with emotions for a reason. And those emotions are there to teach us things and give us information. And fear is just one of those emotions we feel. But the Bible is saying here that there is a difference between fear and the spirit of fear. Which means when you are under control of fear, when you are, the fear controls your life, you're crippled by fear. That means there is a spirit over you. And God says, I didn't give you that spirit. And boy, is the Bible full of stories of men and women who went, who were crippled by, by this same spirit, right? The list is long, from Old to the New Testament. Let me give you a few examples. Aaron, you remember Aaron, the guy? Moses' brother? You remember when the people of Israel are in the wilderness, and Moses is up on the mountain to get the law from God, and the people have waited for over 40 days. Now they think Moses is dead. So what do they choose to do? To build an idol. But again, because Moses left his co-leader, Aaron, down there to be, lead the people, the people turn around and tell Aaron, your brother or that leader that is gone, he's dead. Build, let's build our, our own God. And what does Aaron do? He fell for it. He fell for it. Exodus chapter 32, we see Aaron's fear of the people led to idolatry and the doom of the people. Everything that happens after that falls under the responsibility of Aaron because he was not courageous enough to stand to the people and tell them, we follow God, we obey God, and we wait until Moses is, is, is done. All the, the, the 3,000 people that fell dead after that event, that responsibility, you can say, falls at the feet of Aaron. Why? Because he feared people more than he feared God. King Saul. I love the story of King Saul, man. Because when you talk of King Saul, one, one thing you have to understand, because the, the book of Judges in the Bible ends with a very dreadful story of a civil war between the, the 11 tribes of Israel versus the tribe of Benjamin. And then the next story is the book of, in, when you move the page, you turn the page, you move to the story of Ruth. That gives us the ancestry of King David. So after Ruth, you move to 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel is about the first king of Israel. The first king of Israel is King Saul. And you have to keep in mind that the God's plan was always from Exodus through 1 Samuel. God's plan was always that the leadership of Israel will be held by the tribe of Judah. Joseph prophesied it, Moses prophesied it, and, and, <clears throat> so, and so on and so forth. Joshua prophesied it. So the people of Israel, well, even as they live during the judge's time, they know that the tribe of Judah holds the leadership of the, of the nation. So you have to question yourself, why on earth, in moving to the first book of Samuel, first Samuel, do we have a king coming from the tribe of Benjamin? King Saul was out of the tribe of Benjamin. And the story goes like this. At the end of the book of Judges, you have that event, that civil war, that is at the end leaves the tribe of, of, uh, of Benjamin with 600 men. The tribe was almost completely wiped out of the map. So they had to figure out ways to marry this guy and keep the, the tribe of Benjamin alive. So jumping to 1 Samuel, you have to say, to you, what you see is God doing what he does best, redemption. God is redeeming the tribe of Benjamin by bringing up the first king of Israel out of the tribe of Benjamin. 
King Saul is the manifestation and the expression of God's redemption for that tribe. So God actually goes out of his plan, out of his way to bring this man who is humble. He, he grew up, imagine gr growing up as King Saul before he becomes king. He is, they are the smallest tribe. They are the smallest, the smallest group. And ima imagine what type of saying we're going around. You guys created, made the circumstances for us to go to civil war. You, are, you have to be very humble. That was the culture around. Every other tribe will be criticizing and pointing the finger at the tribe of Benjamin. So King Saul grew up in that environment. No wonder when God calls him, he is hiding on his day of, of uh, inauguration. The guy is crippled with fear, and you can see it coming because that is the, the environment out of the culture. So eventually God wants to restore them. God is really eager to bring back that identity, restore the tribe of Benjamin into the community of Israel using King Saul. But what happened? Because of fear, he forfeited that calling. 1 Samuel 15, 24 says, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have seen, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Samuel called Saul and told him, God is calling you to decimate the Amalekites. He sent him to war. He said, you kill everything. Men, women, animals, you just erase them from the map. And what, is, what does Saul do? He goes, he killed the men, and his army, his generals decide to, pon to, to plunder the, the, the animals and the wives. So he sees that, and he says nothing. Because he feared them, he fears them. So he let them bring the plunder back, and God is furious. And Samuel has to come back and call him out. What did you do? And when you read the first part of the conversation, he's like, I did everything you told me to do. What are you talking about? And Samuel has to say, God is stripping away his authority from you. Because you feared people more than you feared God. The only reason Saul was, was taken, the, the authority and the kingship was stripped out from Saul was not because of his idolatry. There was no other reason. Because he feared people more than he feared God. And he was never able to overcome that fear. Now contrast that with David. David was a man after God's own heart, as the Bible says. But when you compare the, the type of mistakes David did and the type of mistakes Saul did, there is no comparison. Saul didn't go out to, to kill his generals. He didn't go out to take another's, woman, another man's wife. David did. So from our human standard, we would say David was an, more evil in a sense, you know. But the Bible is lifting up David. Why? Because beyond and, be, beyond and above everything, David had one thing at heart. He feared only one thing, God. Even when the prophet calls him out and says, you did this, you, are, you did this, you committed idolatry, you committed murder, this is all on you. What does he do? He says, I repent. I have sinned against God alone. David knew his focus. His, he was centered on that. He feared nobody. No man. Yeah, that's a good word. Don't worry. I came up with my own encouragement. So, Amen. Thank you, wife. And examples, we can, we, can, we can make a long list. Think of Elijah. Elijah took the prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel. 
He had that huge demonstration of God's power, fire fall down from heaven, and now he killed all the prophets. And guess what? A woman called Jezebel, she didn't even show up. She just sent a messenger to carry a message to tell him, by this time tomorrow I will kill you. And what does he do? He ran for his life. Like, the thing is, this is, this is Mount Carmel, when you see the geography, is on the north. So what he does, he leaves that place, he runs through the, the southern, the southern uh, uh, region, and he passes the south, and he goes into the mountain. So the guy went from the, the highest point in the north to the, uh, to the lowest point in the, to, to the south, just running away from Jezebel. Think about it. Just because he got a message that I'm killing you. Right after he had that huge demonstration. Man, fear is irrational. Fear lies to you. It's lying to Elijah. And you, do you know what he tells God when, when the Spirit of God manifests to him? He said, I am left alone. There is nobody else worshiping you. Even though God told him, I have preserved for myself a remnant of worshipers there are 700 servants of god 7000 i'm sorry 7000 worshipers that were protected from the from 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 uh, uh, what, what's his name uh, from from Jezebel and 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 what's the, the, the king's name again oh ahab yeah i protected 7000 worshipers for myself and here is elijah fearful running away from him, for him for his life, telling God, God, you know nothing. I am left alone. There's nobody else. So irrational. And you might think it's just in the Old Testament. Let me take you to the New Testament. And one of our biggest example, you know, one of our best example, Peter. Let's read Galatians 11, verse 11 through 13. Do we have it? No? Okay. Thank you, son. Yeah. Yeah. This is a family ministry. <laughs> Amen. Church is family. Family is church. <laughs> yeah. I'm... It's been two weeks and he's doing a great job. Can we give it up for Josh? Josh is on the keyboard. He's been few, he's, he started last Sunday and he's doing a great job, putting up the Bible verses. You see the lyrics on your screen? That was Josh. Yeah, Josh was doing that, man. He's eight years old, seven years old. He's turning eight in few few weeks. So thank you, Josh. God bless you. Yeah, he's fantastic. I'm so proud of him. Yeah. Amen, amen. That's a good transition to the New Testament. <laughs> yeah, so in Galatians, we see t uh, uh, Paul is writing to the church of, of Galatia, and he's telling, talking about his ministry and tell, uh, talking about his positioning uh, alongside the other, uh, the other apostles. And he's talking about the fact that he actually had to call out Peter. Why? Because of his, his hypocrisy. What happened is this. So you understand that in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10, we see Peter having an encounter with God in the, in the, in the house. He has to go on the top of the house and he has this big vision where, where God brings a, a mat with, uh, with, forg with um, forbidden food like animals and he has to eat it. And he goes, I'm not eating this, God. I've been pre preserving myself holy all this time. And God says, if I say oh, you eat it, you eat it. It's holy. So he eat and then uh, as soon as he wakes up, he wakes up from that vision, uh, you, you have Cornelius. Cornelius is a, is a, Roman, a Roman soldier, actually a, a, a general who sent uh, messengers to call Peter because at the same time God had revealed himself to Cornelius and Cornelius once uh, was told to send people to bring Peter. So Peter wakes, uh, wakes up from that vision and the men are calling uh, in, uh, in, at the door. So he goes and meet them, and based on that vision, he strongly believes that this is God. And he follows them, he, went, he, he goes to Cornelius' house, he speaks, and as, as, 
as he is speaking, the Holy Spirit falls on these Gentiles. You have to understand, for them, it's very, it's a new paradigm at this point. This is Jewish people, Jews who, and they believe that Jesus was Jew, they are Jew, the, the Torah is, from, is for the Jew, the promises of God are for the Jew, so they have no concept of Gentiles coming into the promise. And so the Holy Spirit has to speak this way to Peter for him to come out of that mindset and embrace the Gentiles and bring the gospel to the Gentiles, right? So he has this huge revelation and he speak and the Gentiles now are baptized in the Holy Spirit and they come to the to believe of in Christ. That happens. You will think that at this point, Peter has changed. He understands. And yes, he understands. Yes, he knows that this is now the new paradigm and he is okay with it. But but what happens is that as time passes by, he's visiting churches among the Gentile nations, including Corinth, including uh, this church of Galatia. <clears throat> And what the, the behavior he's displaying doesn't align with his belief. What happens is when he goes there and there is no Jewish man around, he sits with the Gentiles, eats with them. Why is it important? Because for the Jews, it's, uh, it's not okay to eat with them. They have a, a very basic protocol for food. They have to wash their hands. They have foods that they cannot eat, etc., etc. So when he goes and he's among Gentiles only, he understands, he, he acts according to this new belief. But when Jewish people come around who are still struggling with their faith and do not understand that now it's okay to we they're not under the law anymore when he sees them he changes he pretends he's put himself apart and doesn't sit with the gentiles and boy paul saw that happening and paul you read paul and you understand paul doesn't let it fly he called him out that's hypocritical why are you doing that when, the, when you see Jewish because of the fear of the Jewish reaction, you act a certain way. When the, you're only with Gentiles, you act a different way. That's wrong. Don't do that. It reminds me of something in Korea called Nunchi. For the internationals who don't know what nunchi is, I don't know how to explain nunchi. <laughs> N-U-N-C-H-I, nunchi. <laughs> so basically nunchi in Korea, you know, it can be a good or bad thing. It's not, it's not, it's not that clean, it's, it's not a clear cut, like but wrong or, or, or wrong, or good, 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 bad, or wrong, right, no, it's just, it's a capacity to read the room and to anticipate the needs of people around you and act accordingly. So it's about tact, being senseful, being tactful, being mindful of your environment and do something about it, you know? So when, when, you, when you, you're very, a very similar way with this person has a lot of tact or this person can read the room that's basically what nunchi is about. But there, there is another definition associated with this, which is walking on eggshells. And that's really about in, in terms of relationship with people. When we say, in English we say, people walk on eggshells around you. Meaning when people are around you, they don't feel comfortable being themselves. So they have to be very careful about what they do, what they say. You understand that? So that's, what, that's the, the nunchi thing, but it's very strong as a, fact, as a cultural factor in Korea. So Koreans will, in the daily life, they'll say nunchi so, nunchi opso, nunchi ponda. Yeah, so that's a very basic thing in the conversations in Korea. So that nunchi thing is big if you're living in Korea. But one of the places it manifests the most is in the workplace. And I'm gonna, I want to stop here and talk a little bit about this because Man, this is the strong manifestation of fear of man in the workplace. So in Korea, for example, when work over time, working over time, for example, 
I, I remember back in 2014 or 15, me and my team, we traveled to Morocco, and we, we, we had a, about two weeks there, and one thing that the Moroccan team told me around the end of the, our stay, they were like, man, uh, we want to learn one thing from Korea, that, that, that uh, what's that, work ethic, they call, they call it work ethic, but me, I was like, that's just nunchi in Korea, you know? So what's the, the thing is, in Korea, the, w w when you are at the lower level, like uh, you are entry level, you don't leave the office before your, 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 your boss, right? That's just a basic thing. So you wait for the boss to leave before you leave. That leads to something called yagen or, or over time. Meaning, even if you have nothing to do, because you are looking, you are waiting for him to leave first, you end up doing overtime naturally. A lot of people, like, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. It's changing, over, it's changing recently a lot, but that's the thing. But the, the, it's completely the reverse in, in Western culture in other countries. So the Moroccan team was telling me is, I am, he was the boss. He owns the company. And he was telling me, I come first always and I leave last. So I have to wait for, my, for the workers to leave. And if there is one person staying, I have to stay until the end. You see, it's completely the opposite. The reason people do it in Korea is out of fear of men. They want to look good to their boss. They want to get approval. They don't want to get fired. They want to have a good feedbacks. They want to, to you know, get a promotion, get an, a raise. So that nunchi is just the perfect manifestation of fear of man. But beside that, you have a lot of fear as we're talking about Chuso. A lot, People do that because they fear for the future. Like uh, when you get a, when you you have a car accident. Oh my God! Did I did I honor my ancestors? I should go back. I should do something about it. I remember talking with my brother, and he's like, we, because sometimes we have frictions with our parents, and he was like, you know, you should you should do something about it. What if our, what what if something happens to the parents before you do something about it? You see that thing? It's really it's sneaky. It creates anxiety. Now you're rushing to do something using your human ways to fix a problem without trust because you, you fear that something might happen, could happen. Or fear of, you know, the unknown, fear of death. I know that sometimes I feel it strongly. I have to pray against it. I have two kids. I am the bread provider in my family. You know, so sometimes I'm like, I feel it's, it's like a torment. What if something happens to me? What if I get to die today? What will happen to my wife? What will happen to my children? You see, it's not very rational. It's random. It just hits you. But you know what is even worse? And that summarizes all of this is that fear takes away your focus and eventually takes away your worship. You know, fear, what you fear, you worship. You worship what you fear. Let me explain that to you. Pastor Day talks about worship. You, the, the series is on our YouTube channel, so I recommend, I strongly recommend. And as you're there, like, share, subscribe. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> But that series is up there, and one of the things uh, during, I think, the first or the second message, where, when he, go, he goes uh, through the definition of worship, one of the definition of worship is focus. You remember David saying, one thing I desire is to gaze upon your beauty. Gaze upon it, my focus, one thing I desire is to gaze. It's like the one thing I want to focus on in my life is you, your beauty, your presence. Now, what fear does is that it takes away that focus you have and put it on something else. Your life, your, f your, your relationship, your money, and etc etc you end up worshiping that thing you fear if you fear highs you're going to do everything in your life to live low 
If you fear insects, you're going to do everything to keep your, la- your house always clean, pure, neat. If you fear people, if you fear men, rejection, you're going to act and manipulate people to only give you what you need. When you f- whatever you fear, you worship. That's why the Bible goes uh, at length to tell you, fear not, fear not. Because at the end of the day, whatever you you are fearing is that you will worship. And I want to pinpoint that as we're, we're talking about generational fears, right? One of the, the characteristics of the Gen Z, the Gen Z are a thing born between 97 or 96. So they, they must be around 20, between 19 and let's say 27 at now. One thing we, we know about this generation is that they are fearless. They are really fearless, the Gen Zs. Like they don't fear people, believe me, there are groups of HR people who gather to talk for, to get counseling for the trauma they're getting from Gen Zs. Like seriously, Gen Zs at, at work, in the workplace, they don't look, they look at the time, you, you're having a meeting, they look at the time, oh, it's time to go home, see you tomorrow, pick up their back, and they're out of there. They have no nunchi, like zero, they don't care. They focus on their own, you know, personal development. They go to the gym. They go to learn. And when you ask them, what do you do after work? Oh, I, lo- I learn coding. I spend time with my friend. I go to the coffee. Oh, I practice music. And then, but what about your responsibility? It's okay. It's a ve- it's, you can see that. You say, you know, by comparison, the, the, the millennials, us, and the previous generation, we had that strong fear of the future and fear of God. One thing you can test, I recommend it. I think when I was still coming to Korea, when we just came to Korea 10 years ago or 12 years ago, you would still see a lot of people on the subway saying, believe in Jesus or you go to hell. And it used to work. Our parents had that inher- inherent fear of the unknown, of uncertainty. So a lot of, uh, of the, our parents' generation came to Christ because they feared hell. And it's true. Now bring that same message to the Gen Z's. Believe in Jesus or you go to hell. Dude, my life is already hell. What do you think? What do I, what do I fear? You know, I'm already living in hell. What do I need to believe in Jesus? That message doesn't go, doesn't go anymore. It doesn't work. This generation is fearless. And when you, but when you talk to them one-on-one and you really speak to them, you realize that fearlessness that we can actually even celebrate is based on the belief that they can do anything by themselves. They are f- worshiping their own ability to figure out life. And you would, at first you would say, that's brave, that's good. But the, the core motivation, the big reason why they are fearless is because they trust their capacity, their skill, their ability to manage and run their life to success the way they want. And you know what? Even that is wrong according to the Bible. The Bible teaches us that we are to fear God. The Bible doesn't say fear not, be fearless. The Bible teaches us to fear God. And if you don't believe me, read your Bible. It's right there. I can give you 10 different verses that speak, uh, that says that. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs day, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Proverbs 2, 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction and its wisdom. 
Finally, verse, uh, Psalm 34, verse 11. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you what? The fear of the Lord. You see, it's not about fear or no fear. It's fear is a given thing, an emotional thing you will experience when, as you leave. But where do you put that fear is the core question. Can the worship team come back? I'm wrapping up here. The Bible is inviting us to fear, but have our fear centered on God and focused on God. I don't think there is any way you can live your life without fear, but how you, what you, where, what you fear or where you put that fear is the core question. So I'm asking you, church, or as a, at a personal level, what is that fear you're struggling with? What is that vision God is giving you that you, 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 don't, you haven't taken a step to embrace yet because you fear? You fear failure. You fear that you might go out there and just, you know, fail. What is that prophecy that God has over your life that you haven't embraced and stepped into because you fear rejection? Because you fear the people that you have to work with. You know that you're struggling with something in your personal life, but you fear your pastor so you don't go out to talk to him. What is that project that, you, you, that is burning in your heart and you, you just, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting but the main reason is because you're afraid to do something about it what do you worship where is your worship centered are you trying by your own way in your own means you know in a very humanistic manner to run your life and you think you don't fear anything church there is an invitation as we were singing before we were singing earlier God is breaking the chains of fear God is taking out those fears you know in your life so that you can worship him and fear him because the fear of God is liberating. The freedom you look, you're seeking and you're looking for is the fear of God. So I want us to pray now. Why don't you stand? I want you to do a very prophetic action right now and put your hands over your head. It can be both hands or one hand. And I want you to really visualize those fears trying to sneak in your mind, you know, whatever it is. Ask the Holy Spirit right now to show you those fears making their way across your, 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 your brain, across your mind. And you can now identify them. Because sometimes we're actually struggling with a fear we don't even see, we can't even identify, pinpoint it properly. But right now, I 
Ask the Holy Spirit to help you identify that fear. Is it a fear of man? Is it a fear of rejection? Is it a fear of the failing, of failure? Is it fear for your life? You're afraid to die like accidentally? Fear of getting sick and suddenly be gone? Are you afraid for your parents, for your children? Let the Holy Spirit show it to you right now. Holy Spirit, I call upon you right now. Open our eyes to see those things, those fears crippling us, stealing our worship, stealing our focus, taking our attention away from you, that we end up worshiping instead of you. Move, Holy Spirit, move. And let us see it, let us see. Yes, Holy Spirit, have your way. And now that you see, I want you to, to speak to that fear. Command that fear to leave. Command that fear to go. I see freedom. The Lord is bringing freedom, real freedom. He is turning back your eyes on Him. Your gaze is on Him. God, we realign our gaze and our attention on You right now. Holy Spirit, realign our gaze on You. And we cast out those fears. We cast out fear of tomorrow. We cast out fear of tomorrow. We cast out fear of sickness. We cast out fear of death. We cast out fear of people, fear of rejection. We cast you out. We cast you out. We cast you out. We cast out the fear of the unknown. We cast you out fear. And we real we realign our focus, our worship. We cast out all the fears in our lives. Cast out all fear in Jesus' name. Cast out all fear in Jesus' name. Cast out all fear in Jesus' name. Yes, we cast out fears. And we release. Freedom. Fear in Jesus name. The spirit of freedom is in this room. We break free of our fears today. We break free of all our fears. Fear of rejection. Those fears, Lord, crippling us. We cast out fears and we walk free. The chains of fear are falling. We break free. We cast out fear. Who you say Set us free, Lord. Set us free. Who you say Set us free, Holy Spirit. Who you say We cast out fear on you, Jesus. We cast out fear. Holy Spirit, set us free.
continue to pray offer the message just like Virgil said the Bible is black and white and God says fear not but it doesn't stop at fear not it's not saying fear not and just stay in the gray area it's fear not and turn from that and fear the Lord it's not a it's not a restriction saying don't do this it's saying do this this is what you were made for this is the purpose for your life and it's to fear the Lord which is the beginning of wisdom and I want us to reflect going back to the cross the Bible says that the devil has been disarmed Satan has been disarmed at the cross meaning what the only thing he can do is lie to you he has absolutely no power over your life whatever that part of your life that it may be where he's speaking into it's a lie it is a lie there is no power in what he is speaking over your life because the victory has been won at the cross and death has lost its sting so I want us to pray and shout in faith cry out and pray in faith saying fear you have no power over my life you are a lie the devil has been disarmed the enemy has been disarmed and we proclaim it in faith the victory in the name of Jesus once again beloved let's begin to cry out in prayer whatever way and proclaim it in faith fear you have no power over my life fear you have no power over my life and I choose I choose to fear the Lord to stand in awe to stand in reverence to stand in the fear of Almighty God wonderful counselor the good good and everlasting father yes Jesus we fear your name we choose to walk in the fear of the Lord we choose to hold on to the sure victory of the cross we say out leave with authority any fear any lie spoken to us by the enemy we say you have no power no power you are a lie and we cast you out in Jesus name you have no authority over lives we do not trust our feelings we do not trust our thoughts but we trust wholly in the word of God yes Jesus give us the fear of the Lord may we fulfill the purpose yes Lord we trust in your name we trust in your victory and we proclaim it over our lives God our relationships our fulfillment of our purpose and our calling our school our ministry our families every part of our lives we offer it up to you Jesus and we walk in the fear of the Lord yes Lord you're a good good father you are a good good father we trust in you Jesus we trust in you Jesus yes Lord Jesus Lord we thank you 
we thank you for your word that has been spoken over this body father we choose we choose not to fear men we choose not to fear failure because you approve of us as sons we choose not to fear death because you are the resurrection and the life we cast out fear from our hearts by the authority of Jesus and we ask you that you would insert the fear of the Lord in our lives that we would walk in the audience of one for the approval of one and that is you Jesus give us that conviction give us that fear in our hearts and may we walk in this not just today not just tomorrow but for the rest of our lives Lord father we thank you we believe and trust in the work that you've done here today would you increase our love and our awe and our reverence of who you are through this word Jesus we love you be glorified and in Jesus name we pray amen Amen.